Hey everybody, Rex Bear, Leak Project. How the heck are you? I've got Jay Campbell with me and Matthew LaCroix. I would like to recommend going to trtrevolution.com as well as check out Matthew LaCroix's YouTube channel. Just type that in the search engine. Now we're gonna dive deep into the Oxford translations of the Sumerian cuneiform tablets that are about 7,000 years old. We're gonna get very deep into the analysis of Nibiru and actually what it is, um, where it is, if it's real, if it's a cosmic fragment of the Sumerians' imagination. I will say this, I also put together some really good measurements on one of these um, specific scribes, not scribes, but one of these texts, one of these translations. And I was able to break down the words that, you know, people are like, what is that? Where is that? Who is that? So I'm gonna do a really deep analysis on various translations that have been done via Oxford University. And I've, you know, really gonna be able to bounce ideas as well off of Jay and Matt. So thank you guys for joining me here at The Leak Project. Uh, also folks, check out The Coders of Truth. Check out the Facebook page, The Coders of Truth. If you haven't uh, became a member at The Coders of Truth yet, make sure to do so. Um, it is a closed membership, so you have to be pretty cool to join I'm just saying but no check it out you guys it's decoders of truth and there's a there's just a bounty of intel in that group so how you guys doing thanks for joining me great it's awesome to be here how's it going Jay fantastic guys yeah definitely after last week's discussion um, I'm actually on vacation on the East Coast in St. Simon's Island and Matt's part of the world well at least on the East Coast Eastern Standard Time Zone um, but yeah I had to join for today I'm very excited about this let's just get to it yeah, let's let's do it. Let's rock and roll. Now, first of all, I would recommend as well if you're kind of interested in the the polarities, Matthew put together a really good book called The Illusion of Us, and that's available on Amazon. It's a quick read. It has some good information breaking down intel. Now, so let's first get into what we're looking at right here on the screen, and I wanna give credit where credit is due, Oxford University, these are the project members. They did a fan, uh, they did a fantastic job. I just got harped. They did a fantastic job translating these, and there are 148 different references of Nibiru just on this website, just in this treasure chest of Sumerian texts. And I wanna read one at first right here. And this is a praise poem of Sulji. Let praise be sung that I have shown strength in grappling and wrestling. Let deserved praise be sung for me that I have in the land that I have made a return visit to the shrine, Nibiru, and back along the road to Urim and have marched a distance of 30 Dana. So people are like, 30 Dana? Well, my girlfriend's named Dana. She's about five foot seven. Does that mean you times that by 30? No, I had to do some research and find out what a Dana is. And a Dana is, okay, so a Dana is what's considered 30 US in these ancient measurements. A US is 360 meters. So 30 Dana would equal 7,200 meters which would equal a, um, then you'd have to, well, times that by 30, because each Dana, I'm sorry, is 7,200 meters, each Dana, so you times that by 30, if you connect it to this poem right here, and you have 216,000 meters in distance. So that means the traveling that this individual made in this text was a total of 134.216 miles. What do you think about that? Fascinating. Well, it just it just seems like um, they're talking about a shrine of Nibiru. So we're not actually talking about Nibiru itself, but the, you know there was a place on Earth, probably in Mesopotamia, where they were they had a direct connection linked to Nibiru, where they would they would worship. And I think that's what this direct um, reference is referencing right here in this tablet. Now, I've been deciphering various texts, and there was actually a discussion about Nibiru recently, where the trees that were growing there were black birch wood trees or black birch trees. And this is supposed to be one of the only locations that they can grow. And very intelligent people that listen to the YouTube channel said, hey, that's actually in, in North America. That's in the Appalachian Mountains. So that would rewrite everything unless that I've heard the other discussion about how Nibiru is also uh, a city here as well as Nibiru in the heavens. 
And the more research I do into Nibiru, it's a city that's discussed that's the primeval city, the, where the creation is of the demigods that create the fates of the, what they call black-headed people. So are there two Nibirus? I mean, what's your take on that? Okay, I would, I would love to comment on that, Rex. Um, so in, in terms of um, genetics, you're, you're using an example about trees. For, for saying, well, does that mean that Nibiru is actually on Earth? And, and what I see um, really happening there, from what I've looked at in my research, is that a lot of the plants, animals, the genetics that are here on Earth did not start here. They actually came from other places, not just Nibiru, but all throughout different places in the cosmos. You actually can read in a lot of the tablets how um, Ningshida, who was the, 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 the name of Thoth before when he was on Nibiru, and Enki, they used to travel the, travel the cosmos and visit all these incredible locations. And it was actually amazing that, the, that uh, Ningshida Thoth directly says in there, and I think this is in the Emer Emerald Tablets, that he says Earth is one of the most beautiful locations he ever saw in the cosmos. And so there's this, it's this place where it had this, you know, really good atmosphere and habitat. And I think we have a lot of genetics, DNA that was simply brought from, from all over. And black birches are mentioned in a lot of places um, from, you know, in Nibiru. And that's probably because that tree came from there. And they found a suitable climate here in the earth that was, um, that could sustain that tree. I actually have black birches growing right here where I live in Maine. Um, and one of the interesting things about black birches is that they have um, very, very strong medicinal properties with their roots. You can make food, medicine, all these things. And when we read a lot of um, places in the, in, the, in the Bible, they talk about how all these things were lowered from heaven. And we know that heaven is, has been referenced as Nibiru countless times. That, that's, so there's these code things that we think of. We have this, a lot of people have this conception that heaven is this thing up in the clouds, right? Where if you're good enough, you go up there and then hell is something down in fire. Whereas heaven is really just this metaphor to describe their, their, their place, their home. That was heaven. And so coming and descending from heaven was simply descending from the stars and coming down to here, coming down from the, from space. So I, I see Nibiru as being, as being this planet that the reason why we, we, we don't maybe see as many references to it as we see things like the, um, the pyramids pointing to like the Orion and Sirius, I really think that maybe a lot of things have been destroyed or hidden that reference the Bureau because it's in our own, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a binary connected to our solar system. So if we, it would be the, the easiest thing to discover in terms of everybody was looking for it because they found evidence. So I think it's been something that's been very cleverly hidden and it's only been left in, like you're saying, these Sumerian tablets we're reading, these are ones that have been deciphered by Oxford University people who wanted to do this because they were passionate about doing it, not the mainstream archaeological association who throws this up on every newspaper and, and article we have around the world. These are people that are doing it because they want, they, they, they're part of projects and they, they know the, the importance of this work. So we really need to put these Sumerian tablets and the information that's in them with high regard and, and think about the fact that if everything is referencing the Anunnaki and those who came descended from the heavens from to earth, I mean, that would always reference a place that's, that's outside of earth. And I think that the Enuma Elish really speaks to that pretty well. Now, Jay, what do you think about this discussion right now? Well, I, I find it fascinating um, because I, you know, Gerald, all the great researchers spelled Nibiru differently than what, you, you know, is spelled here. Um, and this text or these text decodings from these these Oxford scholars. So to me, it just gets to tell you that this information is so difficult and, and it's so wide, widespread as far as how people are interpreting it that it's it's almost impossible. You know, we talked about last week the riddle inside the enigma. It's almost impossible to truly decode this in a way that everyone uniquely agree on. Does that make sense? It, um, Jay, one of the reasons why it's spelled like that is that uh, Nibiru has actually been um, spoken of as like three different spellings, I think. And oh. the reason for that is the name Nibiru. If anyone's wondering, you know, that's a very strange name or what all these things. The reason it's called that is and if you learn, and this is directly relating to how the planet acts in this giant ellipt elliptical orbit. We, the, the name itself, Nibiru, in whatever variation it is, simply means the crossing. And right, if you right. think about these, 
these passes where it causes destruction and sometimes in the ancient past it's collided with other objects and moon satellites have collided right. this crossing aspect really starts to make sense and it really gives evidence to the fact that nibiru is this destructive planet that crosses right through i don't agree with that i you know i don't agree with that matthew and i'll tell you why because i've read over a hundred different passages from these tablets and not one of them has talked about nibiru causing chaos on the planet as a matter of fact i read multiple um translations recently actually just a couple days ago about how Nibiru actually became barren and Nibiru became a ghost town and then they had to rebuild it. And I haven't found anything about the destruction of planet Earth with Nibiru. Now, what I will say is the information that I have put together makes it seem more of a, almost like a co cosmic, uh, it's got to come from the Pleiades and I'll tell you why. Because the, sev the reference of the seven the seven protectors, the seven luminaries. Um, not only does that connect to the seven chakras, far beyond that, that connects to the Pleiades, the seven cluster star system and the Pleiades. And there's so many references of these Sumerian tablets that are discussing cosmic events and plays, and they're linking people that they give positions of power to these plays and events. Now, I'm not saying that there, there isn't a planet Nibiru. I am not saying that. There very well could be because they refer to it as something in the heavens, which very well could, which sounds like a planet, but they don't give the location except for those little hints. So let's say that there's this orbit of 3,600 years, which I haven't been able to verify yet at all. Well, let's say that it would come from the Pleiades system. Then how fast would it have to travel and what would be the consequences? And it talks about the effects of what happened on Nibiru also. So something definitely happened to Nibiru, whether it was a war, whether it was cosmic events, whether it had issues too, but it talked about the rebuilding of this. Now, here's where, I need to, here's where I'm going to go with this because this is really important. People need to understand this. When I broke down, I'm going to read to you a dedication of a statue, Solji. And you can see it right here on screen. On a day that dawned for prosperity that was destined for rain clouds, he ran from the Kiur of Nibiru to the shrine of Urim, the e temen ni guru and provided the, prince, the, the princely bowls of Nana, set up in the morning dining hall with a copious, or a, a copious ra a ration. On that day, prosperity was decreed for him in a violent storm, a whirlwind that broke out. Utu, Solji returned to the lustrous Ikur. So before I get into details, does anybody know what any of that means? Because I do. I broke can it I, down. Can I comment on that, Rex? Yeah, but let's keep it short, please. Okay. Um, one thing we want to consider is that some of these, there are so many Sumerian tablets, and most of them haven't even been translated yet. And some of them may not even be referencing Earth. As in, I know you mentioned heavens and earth here, but some of the stories they're talking about, a lot of these Sumerian tablets are simply, they're epics, right? They're like the Atrahasis is the epic Atrahasis. It, it talks about his story, right? And that happens to be on earth. But some of these stories and some of the things they wrote about on, on, in the tablets may have been actually referencing the things that ha didn't even happen on earth as well. I just wanted to point that out. Sure, absolutely. And it does have a lot of references to things that happened in the planets, uh, uh, the planets above, the heavens above, the luminaries above. And so let's go and break this down real quick. But before I do that, Jay, do you want to make a comment? No, I'm, I'm just trying to keep up with you, but no, keep going. I, I, the only thing I would say is that this is just, again, um, incredibly fascinating that, that these translations, I would I'd love to find if we could get a person who was a Sumerian uh, linguist, uh, Rex, like an actual real decoder of, uh, of because as I understand it, it's the least spoken and understood language that's on a planet today. Well, um, another thing that makes it difficult, I just, sorry, I just want to say one, one little quick thing, is that um, Nibiru is not the only name that they give. Uh, in the Enuma Elish, one, the Marduk actually named himself after the planet. And so you read about how Marduk uh, crashed and all these things in the Enuma Elish. So that's just something I want to point out is we, we, want, we want to broaden our horizons past just the name Nibiru because it's been called Wormwood, Marduk, right. um, and, and a lot of different names as well. Well, and once again, I mean, that's like saying that you can take all these different names and link it to Lucifer and the devil and the planet Venus. And, you know, you really have to be careful when you say that as fact. Now, I appreciate what you're saying. And there are 
points of reference to validate what you're saying. I think you just need to be real careful to, to say that as fact. Now, once again, this is a round table and we're, we're discussing this in a, in a very respectful manner with constructive criticism. And you know, I appreciate that towards me as well. So I don't know what, I don't have the facts. I'm giving information and I'm also breaking down what these references are. So let's go back to this paragraph because here's what you got to think about guys. When you read this stuff and you read these different words, I mean, you got to know what it means. You got to know where it is. You got to know who it is. For example, when I read this chapter, I didn't know what the Kier really was. I didn't know what the e Temani Guru was. I didn't know what the Ikur was. I didn't know what the Solji was. I had to look all that up. So when you break all this down, well, the Kier is actually just called the key, and it's considered the netherworld or the underworld most of the time. If you look up Father Nana, Sin, the um, Akkadian Anunnaki, one and of the same, the Mesopotamian mythology of Akkad and, and also in Assyria and Babylonia, Nana is a Sumerian deity, the son of Enlil and Ninlil, and became identified with Semitic Sin. The two chief seats of Nana's Sin's worship were Ur in the south of Mesopotamia and Haran in the north. A moon god by the same name was also worshipped in pre-Islamic South Arabia. Ur-Im, Ur, was once a very important Sumerian Anunnaki slash Akkadian deity with the connection of the moon. So, Let's take that even further, and now I'm going to get into a conspiracy theory realm here for a minute because I'm going to look at the predated, um, the, the information where Socrates, Plato, and ancient Gnostic texts discuss people before the moon was parked where it is. There's a lot of information that points to the moon as artificial. Now, you can call that a conspiracy theory. Please do so. Do a little bit of research and look into it, but let's go into this. Let's say when the moon was parked there, if it was... If it was an artificial construct, let's look at both sides of this as an artificial construct and as a natural, um, just natural cosmic events. If it's artificial and it's referencing this father Nana as the moon god, and now you reference that to sin, then you can look at the yin, the yang, the alpha, the omega, the, the two sides of the paradigm, the feminine aspect and the, the male aspect, and you can link it cosmically, but does that mean that there was an actual being? Well, it appears that it might have actually been a bean as well, but I haven't been able to confirm that. But let's go a little bit further here real quick. Keep with me, guys. So we've looked up the Kier. We've looked up what that is. We've looked up Father Nana, what Father Nana is. And to add to that, Ur in the south of Mesopotamia and Haran in the north, a moon god by the, a moon god by the same name was also worshipped in pre-Islamic South Arabia. Ur-Im, a, a Sumerian God, the coastal city near the mouth of the Euphrates on the Persian Gulf, the coastline located in modern southern Iraq. So Urim, or it's called Ur, because this is one thing that Jay brought up a minute ago that makes a lot of sense. Jay says, hey, these, you even look at the word Nibiru, and it's missing the I. And you look at these words, and they, they, they're missing a couple letters here and there. But they're the same thing. Well, when you look up these specific words that I just read from the Oxford translations, well, guess what? You're going to have to look them up with two extra letters, minus two letters, but they're the same thing. So the Solji, what's the Solji? The Solji is actually a Mesopotamian king. What is Ikur? Ikur is the garden of the gods. In Mount Olympus, in Greek mythology, they thought of it as Mount Olympus, as the place where the gods gathered to make the decisions of the earthlings. It's called in Sumerian, the mountain house, the meeting location of the demigods, a.k.a. Anunnaki, Olympian gods, Acadians, potato, potato, tomato, tomato. And I'm going to add a couple more things here because you guys are probably still wondering what E. Tamani Guru is, unless you're a scholar already. That is the ziggurat of Ur, an ancient Sumerian temple built over 4,000 years ago, at least 4,200 years ago, which links to that Solji Mesopotamian king that I just referenced and the Persian temples that were built, these Mesopotamian temples that were built. That's all in connection to what I just said in that one paragraph. So it took me like an hour just to research that one paragraph and link all those different names and times. So what do you, I mean, what does that mean? What do you guys think about that? Matthew, what would you take on that? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the ziggurat, I think you can still, I think still parts of that are still, are still around. You can still find all that. So yep. what you were saying, the, the easiest way to translate all this stuff is break it down by every name and go find out what they mean. That way you can actually get a sense for where these places are. And I think that most of these references that we see uh, are just referencing these, the, the activities of what they were doing at the time based on 
going back and forth between Anu, you know, the, the ruler of all of it. So they had to go talk to the, go up on the mountain and connect with the, the great either father Enlil or who can, who can then talk to the great Anu. And there was always this hierarchy system of them going through to make decisions on the earth. And I think this is just referencing the different places they were going at the shrines and the different, the different houses they were going to literally make decisions about humanity's future and what, what was going to happen for them on that planet and what resources they were obtaining and all these various things. So you just, you kind of read about, so there's so many of these that haven't even been translated yet. And when you, when you actually get to look at them, you just see it's just basically these epic stories or even just day-to-day -day activities of what these Anunnaki gods were doing. Well, so, so I have a different comment, Rex. Um, you guys can still hear me, correct? Yeah. So, Sound um, great. So, okay, cool. So my, my thoughts on this are, and I know where you're going with this, Rex, so I'll just jump right out and, and agree with you. This is all being covered up, okay? The reality is we have software technology today that can decode, you know, millions, as you said, you know, you said it last week, whatever, you know, a million, you know, floating, uh, what is it? I forget the mathematical term for it, you know, per second. They've, they've decoded everything, all these different words with, you know, missing letters or missing files. And then we're also not even talking about the literal translation, right? We're talking about the spoken word translation, which can sometimes mean different um, because remember words have power when spoken. There's bigger, there's a difference, you know, there's inflection and all these. Other, so, so my take is very simply, there is a group of people on this planet, whether they are the Anunnaki or themselves or not, the Illuminati, whoever you want to call it, that has, have fully decoded all of this and they know everything exactly as it is and it's still being kept from us. And these you know, fragments of what you have you know, available on Wikipedia you know, through Oxford um, you know, translations is just, you know, I won't call it bunk, but it's obviously just piecemeal so that we can still all stay in the dark. Because you and I and any of us can continue to read this stuff and try to trans tra translate this stuff and make sense out of it. But as you can tell, it's been left in a way that keeps us from tr knowing the full truth, which is obviously what they've designed for us since day one. Yeah, it's like basically just give them whatever little fragments are left over from all these disasters or whatever wasn't destroyed. And just, you know, let, let the the little people try to figure it out. They're not going to get very far, right? Right. I mean, but do you agree with that, Rex? I mean, do you kind of agree that there's no question that all of this has been translated with the technology that we have available to us at the highest levels? You know, I mean, here's what I think. I think that they give us bits and pieces of truth and right. we have an opportunity to get a lot of truth. And then at certain levels, because of certain industries and institutions that want to keep people in the dark, they'll take the most important things. For example, maybe saying one of these hieroglyphics is 3,000 years old when it could be 30,000 years old. Exactly. Yeah, it makes well, a pretty big difference, you know? Yeah. And let me add to this real quick. Let me add to this because here's something else I've been doing research into. The, um, they're called erratica or the errata. Uh, they sound like, it sounds like erotica. That's why I'm thinking of the, the term here. I did some research on them recently. It's a, it's a culture, the master builders that built the Gobekli Tepe, and okay. they are absolutely incredible. They predate the Sumerian culture by approximately 20,000 years, and they were talked about by the Sumerian culture as the master builders, as those that built these incredible temples and technologies. So then you take this information back another 20,000 years. And then you look at these Egyptian hieroglyphics that are just absolutely incredible, cutting edge, where they were able to dissect the afterlife. And they were able to put it onto paper and actually describe how you can manipulate the afterlife in, the, in, this, in this life. It's incredible. So, yeah, we get lied to about things. And then they throw us truths and, and little bits and pieces and let us go kind of with the carrot at the end of the stick. And I really think that because of that, it takes – divine intervention it takes not only the spark within ourselves that god has given us to find because we are in an information uh, hard drive right now we are in an information highway where this information is in front of us in signs and symbols and even down to the quantum level you can find the microcosms within everything and in this holographic construct matrix that we live in every small piece every sum makes up the whole so i mean it's just fascinating and yeah you're absolutely right jay when you say they lie to us about stuff they throw us they throw us the, the scraps too like here you go here you go little yeah, boy let me get it Hey, hey, real quick, Matt, before you jump in, yeah. so let's stay there because I, I know where you're going with this, Matt. I'm reading your mind right now. We're so psychically connected right now. But so would we say then that this master builder race, which we all three started to talk about a little bit last week, 
Rex brought it up and then we talked a little bit about it last week. Would we, would we want to say to just try to put it into the timelines of our understanding of history that there have just been so many different beings, obviously sentient, obviously of advanced technologies, probably of different, um, you know, dimensions, you know, or, or not dimensions, but just, you know, yeah, I guess dimensions, you know, fourth, fifth, sixth dimension that have come here, you know, throughout our, you know, billion year old, you know, planet's history and, you know, established their domain. And before you answer, Matt, you know, I was actually just reading about the domain expeditionary force, which, you know, Gerald, I know you and Rex have talked about that, or I mean, Rex, you and Gerald have talked about that. Um, but I was just reading about that, the Ohara Mazda, and the domain forces and stuff like that. And then there was an ancient aliens episode. I, I wasn't doing any research, but some, somehow it led me to that this morning because somebody sent me an email and a link about it. And I was just reading it for like five minutes this morning. But would you guys agree then that it's so impossible to figure this out because there has been so many beings that have come here and set up shop and obviously interjected with us and then obviously tweaked us and engineered us. I mean, if we start thinking about the, you know, the master builder races being before the Anunnaki, which it seems like they might've been, I mean, were they even part of the Anunnaki? That's where it gets really, really crazy. So it's like my working, you know, thesis of what's going on is that there's just been so many races, like you said, Rex, that it's impossible to truly know without divine intervention. Um, well, well, I, mean, I, I, I hate to use that word impossible just because when you put a label as something impossible, then you've already built those walls and it's, it's near impossible, man. It's freaking tough, but right. you know what, Jay, we can do it, man. And that's the beauty of this. I feel that it's coming to light. I really do. I think it is people like I, you, people like Matt, really. people that are listening to this program right now that are looking for the truth. Enough of, enough of us look for the truth and it's either going to put these guys in a corner to where they're going to lash out big time, which they very well could do, or it's going to be that, you know, hundred monkey syndrome, that hundred awesome person syndrome that turns into this intergalactic change. So let's, let's hold the ladder. It doesn't take very many people, you know, to, to cause a rupture of truth throughout. Uh, and I'd like to point out, I think it's so difficult to figure this stuff out because of how disastrous the cataclysms have been. Right. Where, where these things are, have, have had to survive them. I mean, if you look at, most structures that we have, you know, that are only a couple hundred year, years old that we've built, you go out in the woods and find some place that's barely even left. Well, try to, how about try to have something that's a hundred thousand years old that's gone through, you know, more weathering and disasters than you can imagine. And also, Jay, the Anunnaki, Anunnaki are actually referenced as the master builders, interesting enough. They're called that. And right. that's the reason why there's these giant structures on the moon and all these various things here is that when these disasters occurred after these Anunnaki rulers we have had to recreate the infrastructure of our planet. And that's what we have now all of a sudden. And I think, and I, and another reason why this information has been so, so hard to find in the past and then kind of we're at this juncture now where this stuff is exploding online is that if you look at when a lot of these discoveries were made in Egypt and in Mesopotamia, a lot of these discoveries were being made around the late 1930s and 1940s. And that's right when World War II started. And I mean, major discoveries, uh, the Nagamati Library and all these places were, where it was completely going against all these, other, um, the, all these other models they were teaching us. And of course, what's the best uh, way to misdirect people's attention would be to have a world war, right? And yeah. I think that was one of the reasons, one of the, one of the reasons, I wanna point that out, one of the reasons why the timing of World War II ended up the way it was, was that there was this entire, and, and after World War II, you can look at where the, the curriculum was set up in, in the United States and a lot of places in the world, and it was, it was changed and altered right after that. They used to actually teach a lot more about this in the past. Before the 1940s, they had a lot of, um, where you could really learn about the gods of the Greeks, and you could learn about a lot of these, the Mesopotamian gods, and then of course all that stuff was done away with, and we have the model we have now, but, but I see that as a way to kind of manipulate to try to hide all this stuff. Because then if you have just people who are trying to do this, like us, right? We're just people trying to do this. We're not some, these professors that are getting paid to just sit in their lab all day and, and work through this. If you just have people trying to do it, how hard is that gonna be for them to try to put it together? It's almost like a bunch of, bunch of people all screaming to try to figure it out and then nobody thinks anything's real. That's, I think that's exactly what they wanted. You know, I want to jump in real quick. It's the errata people. And like, doesn't that kind of sound like erotic, errata? Anyway, so maybe my head's just in the clouds. Hello! The errata is a land that appears in Sumerian myths surrounding 
and Merkar. Now, here's what's interesting about this. This is a culture at least 27,000 years ago, and this is the culture that was described by the Sumerians also as master builders. And if you look at the role in Sumerian literature, you can, you can get a few tidbits right here that are right there for your pleasure, ladies and gentlemen. And what else is interesting is it's the home of the goddess Inanna, who yeah. transfers her allegiance from Arata to Uruk. Or Uruk. Now, here's another interesting thing, is if you look at these different pieces of literature that are in Sumerian culture. Now, it's interesting because a lot of people have read the Atrahasis, and a lot of people have read the Epic of Gilgamesh, and a lot of people have read a few amazing scriptures of Sumerian literature, and then they will classify the majority of their knowledge base on the Anunnaki and these ancient deities in reference to just a few pieces of literature. And I think that's kind of dangerous because the more research that I've done in different pieces of literature, the, you get cosmic events, you get plays, you get songs, you get, you get soap opera events. I mean, it's, it's all intertwined. And then you start learning about Enlil, like you, you've even brought up before, Matthew. If you say En and Enki and En and Lil, that has a different meaning. So you have to know which meaning at which time they meant when they said Enlil or, uh, you know, en -lil or Enki. And it's just fascinating. So let's look at these guys right here. These are the guys that built just some of the most incredible temples that we're uncovering now that are over 12,000 years old. They're linking them at 12,000 years old. And there's the one in the Turkey region that they found, which they call the oldest temple in the world, Gobekli Tepe. And if they built that temple at least 12,000 years ago, and more likely 20,000 years ago, then who was before them? Right. And who was before them? Well, that, I mean, that's where it gets really confusing. And then, you know, let's not forget, you know, I, I mean, I think most of your viewers and people know this that watch us, but I mean, they built this with technology that we still don't even have available to this day. They still do not have the refinery to build stone, you know, of size at, in those shapes to, 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 with that kind of grand design. I mean, it's impossible. So, I mean, this isn't even at this point, like you said, Matt, before, it's not debatable you know, people around the world who are aware and awake and becoming higher conscious are, are totally, you know, hip to the fact that this, this, this is obviously technology that we don't even understand um, today, even with all of our great tools and stuff to us. I mean, at least in the, in, the, in the mainstream, in the public eye. I mean, yeah, they probably have stuff in the secret space programs and behind closed doors that we, that, that, that probably is the same tech. But I guess it just, to me, it's just so fascinating, Rex, because I look through this and it's just still all the same Sumerian gods and kings list and, and, you know, names are a little bit subverted and changed and tweaked. But it's the same thing. So it's like, you know, there really is the origin I mean, we don't know really what the origin is. If the Sumerian, you know, if that's the origin of, of our, you know, our progenitor race, I, I don't know. But I mean, clearly all these other races have a Sumerian link. Yeah, I mean, you see the name Anana right there. It just tells you, you get, you get a direct connection that this is, this is related to the same story. It's just, they're just, it's just part of, our, our, obviously our, our story is part of, we have many different beings. The Pleiades are definitely a major player in, in our story. As, and I, so I think, yeah, it, I definitely don't want to just say Anunnaki because they're not, there's not just an Anunnaki race. They're just beings from the, from Orion and Sirius and the right. Pleiades. It's just, they were just, we're just talking about different empires and different. That's I, think, I think that's well said, Matt. I, I, I don't want to interrupt you, but I think, I think you just hit the nail on the head. I think, I think people need to start understanding that when we classify the term Anunnaki, that this is just a name that was given to, you know, to them by the Sumerians, um, obviously by other races. They have different names for the Anunnaki. But I think you're right. I think we need to stop classifying, like, mentally, all of us as, like, a group of, you know, maybe they were the master builders, you know, the linguists, the, you know, the EA, Enki, and, and Leo, and all of this, the two clans. I mean, I think we have to just start realizing that they are just a, a categorization of you know our progenitor lineage and you're right it could have been literally they could have done this like 10 15 times over millions of years they could yeah. have been here establishing exactly. on and on look at the story look at the story with the dogen in right. look at the story in the dogen in mali africa you look at all the similarities with these this water being right that right. they that they that they met that gave them all this wisdom of the star sirius well you learn and you connect that fish suit that he's wearing and all the Sumerian stuff. And you learn that the, that the, the Dogen, they called those beings the Nomo. Right. They didn't have any kind of an Anunnaki name or any Enki name or anything like that. They called them the Nomo, which was, which was referencing fish people. Right. Because Enki, 
always referenced himself as like Lord of the Oceans, and he was ref one of his symbols was was the ocean, the sea. So you learn that the Nomo was just another name for Enki, and you see, ah, it's the same thing. It's just different names across different cultures and different people that just had different references for what how they described them. These great gods. All right, folks, you need to take a look at this. This is called the Tiger Stream uh, streaming device. Pretty much, we're getting rid of cable because we heard about this. Hey, Y'all already know it is, your boy Sells, your boy. Shout out to Tiger Stream. We just opened it up straight out the box. Yeah, man, you ain't got this in your crib. You ain't no big dog, man. And I finally figured out a way to cut the cord for good and no longer pay subscription for cable. This is a really handy device that allows you to stream live content straight to your TV. And the Tiger Stream is the best media streaming Android device that I've ever when used. When it comes to looking for something to watch, I swear, I swear, the Tiger Stream box is king. From the moment you open the box, the Tiger Stream is going to stand out from all the other streaming box providers. I put this thing through its paces, and let me tell you guys, this thing is a game changer. If you're like me, and you are sick and tired of Feeding the beast. With all the content this device can access, it literally pays for itself in just a few months. This is hands down one of the best options for a direct cable or satellite replacement box I've ever used. How much money do you pay for cable, you know, paying it to Comcast? Every movie ever made since the 1930s. Well, this new device right here, this device is gonna change the game all together. Well, and when you put all this together and then you even see how in various Hollywood films the Anunnaki are presented, where, where do we take it? And if, if we really come to the conclusion that there's beings, Enki, Enlil, Ennu, and Nana, if they're actual beings and they're controlling things, like where are they? What are they doing? I mean, are we all like just a fragmentation of their mind in some VR system and that explains the holographic universe and the quad code DNA and how we see things that, you know, like how certain people can see ghosts and spirits and it's just, I mean, where do we take it? What do we do? And, and here's another thing I want to add to that. If you read the ancient texts, they certainly talk about how they looked at people as subhuman. Right. Uh, you know, as as them being superior. So, did they change their minds? Did they finally say, ah, oh, you know, we need to work together? They're like, okay, we're just going to utilize them as a farm, as a feeding source. I mean, some people think they're great. Some people think they're they're not. So, what do yeah. you guys think? I would love to take that. Um, this is something I love to study on this. They're, they're just they're just like us. They have the different factions of every type of, you know. Um, type of person that's going to be out there. Someone extremely jealous and has a lot of hatred and, and just someone who's incredibly, you know, loving and wants wants to see the success of a conscious being. They're not all just some Borg species that all has the same mindset. Um, and you, you, you asked some very important questions. Where are they all, right? If you read some of the Sumerian tablets, they talk about how there was discussions about how um, Isis or Ninharsag, as she was called, uh, when she was returning to Nibiru once, uh, she was told that she looked extremely aged. Ninma, it looks extremely aged when she's on, when she gets back to Nibiru, because the, the, the gravity and the size of the planet, everything is completely different here. So the, the, what you take from that is that if they stay here too long, some, some places have actually referenced it that if they're here too long, they can never go back because they become too adjusted to our gravity. And if they were to try to go back, they could actually die. So some of them, there are some Anunnaki who have possibly gotten stuck here and marooned here and could never leave. And that maybe is one of the reasons why there's so much tyranny and hatred about having uh, times moving over and shifting towards new, uh, new leadership, like Marduk not wanting to give up his throne type of thing. And, and you said, where are they all? Well, they're, they can manipulate, manipulate us from just this third dimension, we are just like these receptors that can manipulate. I think a lot of people, a lot of the people here on the planet, like Thoth talks about how they can, you can kind of 
play with people and, and either inspire them or sometimes you can um, darker entity entities can actually cause them to be possessed like we see in a lot of these elite families and in, in higher structures of government so there's there's both sides to it that, that may be all they're doing with people is using us like puppets like pawns in this third dimension well one let me just say one thing real quick before we jump in rex um one 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 conversation that i had with gerald way back when um about the idea that they were here now and again i'm 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 citing information from other sources i'm i'm, I'm the learn project you know, which Michael Lee Hill, the Wingmakers, uh, you know, this group, this like high level government research group um, that Gerald gave me access to. I got some PDFs that I read stuff. So, uh, supposedly, and then there's a writer, and I can't think of him. The guy writes for the Military Times or the uh, the Army Times or something like that. And I can I can cite or you know post links to his articles. The guy's not a crackpot at all. But um, th there's been times where they have the Anunnaki that have stayed behind have revealed themselves to people. Um, like the highest level governments like there's you know stories that I've read that Gerald shared with me um, in Africa Matt I think he shared this too with you in 2014 um, in a really remote place in Africa like supposedly Marduk has revealed himself to people so I, I don't really yeah I, I can't confirm any of that this is data that I've you know read from other people who are that was in Egypt wild. yeah it was somewhere in Africa I can't remember but um but it's been recent. So, and again, that's all I wanted to say is that, you know, the, there are, you know, high level government groups, black operative groups um, that are supposedly in cooperation and communication with some of these Anunnaki that have been left behind. And Matt is right. Um, they're not all nefarious. There's some of them that are actually, you know, for the advancement of our species and for the advancement of, um, you know, us evolving. So it's, it's very confusing. Well said, Jay. Yeah, that's great. Absolutely, Jay. And also on top of that, I want to add, let's go back for a minute to that one discussion we were having about that specific a dedication of a statue. So it talks about on the day that dawned for prosperity that was destined for rain clouds. So let's, let's break this down as a collective whole here if we can for a minute. So he ran from the Kir, so that means he ran from the netherworld or the underworld of Nibiru. So it says he ran from the underworld of Nibiru to the shrine of Urim. Now that Urim, once again, is a, it was a very important Sumerian city. And then it says the Itemeniguru, which is the, um, the Zagonot, that I should, that their, their temple that they built. And they provided the princely bulls of Nana. So that's the moon god in the morning dining hall. So the day of prosperity was decreed for him. And there's a violent storm, whirlwind that broke out, Utu, Solji returned to the illustrious Ikur. So Solji, he, he freaks out. He's the king, right? And he takes off back to Ikur, which is a city. It's actually more important than the city. The Ikur is what we're looking at right now. It's the Garden of the Gods. It was considered Mount Olympus in Greek. It's where the gods went together to decide what would happen of the Muatus. Crazy. Yeah, it's it sounds like it, it just from what you're reading, it sounds like he, you know, going into the underworld, maybe maybe it's even referencing some kind of a, a portal device to, to even get here. I mean, I, that's very I there's so many Sumerian um, writings to read through. I that's one I haven't actually even gone through yet. But it, it really does sound like it's some kind of a, a portal a portal connection here or or something where they can travel. Um, because I mean, to go in the underworld is you're either talking about going actually physically under massive underground tunnels, or you're using it as some kind of a, maybe you're using it as a, um, a reference to a lower dimensions because earth after all is in a lower dimension than, than their planet. Did you guys hear me get into the, um, Sumerian tablets that talked about Inanna's descent to the underworld and Gilgamesh's messenger's descent to the underworld yeah I, I listened to i think i listened to one of those it was really good jay did you the only reason i'm asking is jay did you hear it um i may have but i mean i'm very familiar with the addition text about osiris and all that in the underworld right right but this is still the sumerian stuff but the, the only reason i'm bringing this up is is when they went to the underworld they um they said look if you're going to go there you can't have any emotions and they talked about what they could and couldn't do before they went down there and when Gilgamesh's messenger goes down into the netherworld he doesn't listen to the advice of Gilgamesh so guess what he gets stuck down there and they have to save him but it sounded like they couldn't make any emotions or do anything which made me think of 
you know, being in underground, being, you know, like with the dead, you know, and, and, and then it made me think about that crazy experience that I had that I told you guys about where I literally felt like Archon food, where I couldn't move unless I was allowed. And then, you know, there was some, there was, a, there was a, an entity, there was something there, or maybe it was just in my mind is like, get out of here. You know, it was like, you don't want to be here. Don't come back. And uh, I don't know. What do you guys think about that? Well, the, the underworld is definitely referenced in countless, countless, countless things. I mean, it's, it's talked about everywhere. And like you said, it's, it's, it's got to either be, um, it's, it's either symbolically of also talking about under, underneath our feet, deep within the earth, or it's also talking about these lower dimensions. So that's somewhere I go back and forth about, is, is referencing a, a, the physical underworld, the abzu underneath us, or is it, are we talking about some kind of a lower dimension? And I think that's where we as people trying to figure this out have to, um, I think we just have to wait for the future because a lot of this stuff is, is even beyond what most people's comprehension, you know, a lot of the, these gods were, were beyond um, even a lot of the mental capacity of what any human could even imagine right now on this planet. Well, I agree, Matt. I mean, let's, I mean, that, that's very well said. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, we're three dimensional beings. Okay. I mean, obviously some of us who are aware, many people in the Decoders of Truth watching, you know, the Leak Project. And, and by the way, all the people that are live right now watching us, thank you guys for your support. We appreciate it. Um, but the reality is, is that you're right. I mean, we can't comprehend things outside of our, you know, limited, you know, meat modem, you know, guys' uh, brains in the third dimension. I mean, we think we can, you know, we, we can try to calculate things and think about beings that are in different dimensions. But I mean, if they are in different dimensions and they, you know, it goes back to our conversation last week when we talked about what is Nibiru. Well, what if Nibiru is a body, you know, uh, an interplanetary body in a different dimension and that the yeah. reason people can't find it is because it's in a different dimension. Well, if that's the case and it sounds reasonable to assume that it is then everything else that we're talking about, obviously with the, you know, the, the inhabitants of Nibiru, the, you know, the Anunnaki, the, the, the uh, master builder race, whatever, they're all interdimensional. So I think it, I mean, we could really shift this, you know, into a, the discussion because, you know, we have obviously some other discussion points. I mean, this has been an awesome discussion already, but, um, you know, we can start talking about like reincarnation, you know, and we can start talking about the, the soul. You know, and CERN. Well, maybe, Jay, that's yeah. the whole purpose behind CERN is the fact that they're home and they themselves are in another dimension. So the only way to actually access to pass through what, like, um, ele you know, certain rare elements or technology or whatever you wanted to do, instead of flying to point A to point B, as our limited minds try to always come up with, you try to, you try to cut through, right? You create some kind of a wormhole where you can, you can actually cut through. And I think that's what CERN really is. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's so, it's, it's all fascinating to me, but, and then obviously it's even, the, the further you go down the rabbit hole, you know, and I, and I just read recently, um, as I mentioned last week, I read the Omniverse. It's actually, I read it actually about two and a half months ago um, by Weber, uh, Alfred Lloyd Weber, Alfred Michael Weber, whatever his name is. I can't think of him right now. He's a brilliant guy. Um, but it just talks about, you know, how, how diverse everything is and how hard it is to truly understand things, you know, from our three dimensional perspectives. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, I, no one really knows what CERN is. I mean, you know, we look at the imagery, you know, and what is the main imagery? They have the image of Shiva. Um, you know, Gerald talks about, you know, what he thinks CERN is. I mean, obviously, Matt, you do. I mean, Rex, we've talked about it many times. Um, it's a very interesting time to be alive, guys. Yeah, oh, it is. Sure. And we linked it, you guys. The actual uh, statue out there of Shiva. Remember the Rig Veda that I read where the um, gift that was given as a weapon and the, one of the most powerful weapons that could destroy time and matter itself and the sp and space, the heavens right. and the earth. Yeah. Guess who was given? Shiva gave that weapon. And that yes. was the it link. Right there. It's connected right there. That yeah. was all that I needed to, to take it over the top for Great me job, personally right. and, and confirm that. So, you know, here's what I want to talk about too, Ikur. The, the Garden of the Gods. Is this where these Anunnaki, is this where the Akkadians gathered when they decided the fates of the people that they manipulated. And you know, here's another thing that I want to add real quick before I can get all excited like a, like a, like a, I remember going back and reading all these stories about how the reason we went into Iraq was because of stargates and to gather all these yeah. ancient relics yeah. and technologies. And I'm like, no man, it's just the oil. And the oil was a big part of it. The defense contracts were a big part of it. Those are all pieces of the puzzle. It's not just one piece. Exactly. There's another piece, ladies and gentlemen. E. Kerr and many of these places that we're discussing in the Sumerian texts, guess where they're located? 
in southern Iraq, right. in areas that have been just blasted to hell with depleted uranium. And, you know, oh, it's, it's we got to protect America because they got weapons out there. They got weapons of mass destruction. We don't have any, but they do. So we're going to get them. Oh, wait, so we, you create have, we're, we're, we control it because we take care of people. We love you so much. We okay. keep the marisol. <laughs> so they create terror in a certain place to no. make people believe that they should be fighting there, like the Middle East, and then throw us into a turmoil when the real motive behind it, like you said, behind, behind just the petrodollar, is, is simply just to get access to steal all of these ancient Sumerian things. You can actually look and find, there's a lot of people that have shown evidence uh, that the U.S. government actually raided uh, the Iraqi museum. Oh, right. And raided all, countless of, of, the artifact, of the artifacts there. And then, of course, you see ISIS, this terrorist group, going around just destroying every, every single Sumerian um, structure that they can. Why would a terrorist organization, right, just trying to control people and get money and had be a terrorist why would they be going out of their way to hunt the hunt down all these rock structures that have no interest to them and destroy them unless they're simply like these hired goons to kind of finish the job of what wasn't done during the iraq wars well i think i, I think let me just say i think it's just still the warring clans right we we know that the anunnaki are at war they've been at war forever and you're right they hire different factions of human beings to do and carry out their bidding. And what if guys, you know, Rex, cause you just brought up something fascinating. And I, and I know, you know, and I, and I know, um, you know, Joseph Patrick Farrell, you know, give, give him a lot of credit cause he's done a lot of research into um, looking into um, Iraq, you know, at the first Persian Gulf war and what was really going on with Bush, you know, raiding the temples and looking for us. Rex, what if, what if that, that really was just the Anunnaki, you know, whatever clan, the Enlil clan, you know, in charge of the Bush family, um, looking for that weapon, that that weapon, and what if they found that weapon, and 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 then you know put two and two together, and then all of a sudden, well, CERN there comes. You go, into, Jay. There you go. CERN comes into existence. So there's a very stark, st excuse me, stark reality of what can be interpreted and what is myth or fantasy. And I really think that you know Hollywood does such an amazing job of kind of telling us what's really been happening you know, behind the scenes in their, you know, fantastic way. Yeah. And maybe as, as you and I and all three of us are becoming more and more aware, and obviously thousands of people like us, maybe there's just a lot way, a lot better way to connect the dots. And maybe that's really what this is. And it's just constantly the war between the clans and the clans, you know, moving their chess pieces around the board, you know, going back to Jason and the Argonauts, you know, Gerald's always fond of that movie. Um, and they're just kind of showing how they puppeteer us. And one last thing about the occur, um, I want to I want to stress this to everybody that's watching this or will will watch this in the rewind. If you guys really want to understand what the hell is going on in the world, become familiar familiarize yourself with both Greek, Roman, and Norse mythology. Yeah. Okay. Because that is literally the literally the underlying riddle that has been puppeteering all of us. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's hard to translate Sumerian. I, I, I think most people, like there's the English translations, most people are watching this in English. I know there's other foreign people that are watching this and thanks for watching us. But if you can read English, it's pretty simple. You know, Rex put something on there the other day about the mythology, an encyclopedia of mythology. If you familiarize yourself with that, you will definitely know what's going on. It, history repeats itself. It has a, a very eerie way of doing that. Now, if you guys can see what I'm sharing with you right now, this is a Sumerian star map. And, you know, one thing that I can confirm based upon the data that I've seen is the asteroid impacts that have taken place over the past approximately 11,000 years. There seems to be a 5,500 year recycle button or something because the 3600 year thing I haven't confirmed however this right here is over okay so this was 5500 years ago approximately the exact date has been referenced because of a very you know technologies like um, what's that star map technology that you can type something into and it'll tell you the location of a, of a planet it's um, oh yeah it's a google thing there's a specific name for it, star maps, whatever you can, there's all sorts of software programs you can get free and pay for, and it'll show you where the stars were a thousand years ago, 2000 years ago, 3000 years ago, etc. They link this specific tablet to an asteroid impact that ha that over happened over Austria. 
And this also has been referenced in the prophecies of Sodom and Gomorrah because it also it affected many parts of the world. And it even created this like valley from the raining fire because the asteroid didn't hit the planet. It exploded in the atmosphere and then it caused raining fire that was described in Sodom and Gomorrah. So they've actually been able to put a date of 5,500 years of a serious catastrophe. Then you can go back to an ancient temple that was probably built by these master builders pre-Sumerian times that depict a asteroid event happening 10,500 BC. So once again, you've got that you know 5,500 year recycle set. That doesn't mean that recycles the whole world, but definitely a part of the world is gonna have to rebuild. And then I think about right now where we're at, was there ever a position before where the world had 449 nuclear ticking time bombs on fault lines and you know seismic zones and anywhere for that matter and, and tens of thousands of fracking sites and, and locations that need to have electricity and energy and manpower, personnel, men and women to protect or you know maintain so they can continue to work another day because these nuclear reactors that last for thousands of years, if they don't stay at a specific temperature, if there isn't somebody to keep them at a specific temperature, well, then they go into meltdown. So how do we, you see those films about, oh, here's the earth 200 years after man. And it's all beautiful and there's no more buildings because they've all been you know, dilapidated from beautiful plants and stuff like that. Will, will that even happen? Or is it to the point now where the, whatever it is that's whispered in the ears of these you know, scientists and engineers and people that are also above them that decide what takes place in these reality realms that we live in on this you know, dualistic world here, in this very dense form of reality, did, did they get to the point now where it's too late? You know, they've whispered in so many ears and they've done so many things to cause an effect of actual doom, end of life scenarios that it's too late for us. And they know that. So we're just kind of waiting and they're just taking as much as they can until it's just there's nothing left. Or do we have a chance? Um, I would say we absolutely have a chance, but it's we're going to go through some extreme turmoil on this planet. We're talking about, you know, like Jay says, the magic money system that's been controlling it for so long that's been kind of patched in about a million times, you know, combining with, you know, all the religions, but, but really that are going to collapse. I'm t really, we're talking about these, these years, like you were saying, these disasters on the earth or environmental things that we've caused and all these various things. And I see this, uh, you know, darkest before the dawn type of scenario where we're kind of, we're at this, these last days of the old power fighting, you know, what happens whenever an army is about to be overtaken and lose? They usually will destroy everything they have and not care and kind of just give up, give in. And the whole thing starts collapsing and everyone turns on each other. I think that's what we're starting to see. It's like this, it's like this collapse of the old system. So they're just polluting and trying to destroy whatever they can at the very end because it's kind of gotten out of control. But I, yeah. but I do see, as dark as that may seem, I see at the same time, a world population of so many people that are waking up all the time that even our just our collective itself has moved on to a place where they so many want to protect the earth and so many want to move forward with another future that that future that they want to envision for us of doom and destruction and some new world order that takes over i don't think that that's going to be able to manifest well so so mike you guys know my take but i'll say it real quick on this and then um Let's, Rex, let's, let's uh, summarize the show and uh, get off because I know we've been on for like an hour. But um, so my take is that, and, I, and this sounds naive, but I used to be of a much darker, much more pessimistic viewpoint. Um, world would have already been destroyed, okay? Yeah. If, if, you look, if you look at what's happened in the last hundred years with World War I and World War II, somewhere along the line the you know ets the benevolent interdimensional beings whomever they are the good anunnaki or whatever they're 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 subverting us from destroying ourselves now obviously my viewpoint is based on the fact that the the earth is this amazing you know planet of resources and they these other beings who are far advanced of us need it you know for other specific things whether it's you know to mine minerals whether it's for you know us you know for the life forms i don't know the terraform it doesn't matter I don't let the planet blow up so however bad thing whatever happens to the planet the powers that be so to speak in the technological you know universal 
hierarchy are not going to allow this planet to go boom. So my take is, you know, that there are going to be a lot loss of life in my guess, I would assume. Um, I don't know how it's going to all materialize, but I mean, we just have history to, you know, to judge by, right? And we know that there's been multiple ELEs, you know, there's been, you know, as you said, Rex, you know, asteroid crater impacts. We know the dinosaurs have been extincted. I mean, who knows how many times, you know, human beings or, you know, our forefathers before sapiens sapiens were extincted. It's going to happen. You know, are we lucky enough or, you know, you know, uh, not lucky enough, depending on your perception to be around when another one of those events happens. I don't know, but I mean, I can look around in our geopolitical world right now and I can see pure instability. Okay. I see a world that is just different than, you know, what should be. There's so many people in service to self. It's just, it's crazy. And so it's like, if, if, if there is going to be a, a purge or a cleansing and we are going to move into a quote unquote golden age, um, there has to be a massive change, and I don't see the change happening in, in, in a super positive way. I hope I'm wrong, but I just I don't see it. No, Jay, that was really well said. I, I agree with everything you said there. And um, most importantly, we got to remember, if you look into the Cold War and you look into this, you know, this big battle of powers between the two armies, the United States versus Russia, back and forth for countless years, there's actually documented proof that talks about how people – scientists had, or the, the people, the military was, was actually try, was going to launch nuclear weapons and actually tried to hit the button multiple times right. and were intervened and not allowed to power went out. Something went wrong. It, this, like Jay said, we would have already destroyed ourselves if it was up to the, yeah, but they, the missile silos were deactivated. The nukes were yeah. turned off. I mean, I mean, there, there's powers way beyond our understanding that are involved right now in our affairs, both militarily and obviously um, governmentally. So, you know, that, that can't even be debated anymore. I mean, sure, you can be low conscious and debate us, but that's not for anyone of consciousness. They already know that. And again, brilliant. I like that NLP trigger word there, Jay. That was good. You like that? Brilliant, brilliant researchers. That's a lot, man. That, that, that was, uh, I think, a thousand dollar course at one time, Rex. But m millions of, uh, or I'd say not millions, but hundreds of researchers have proven this out. And I don't need to name names. I mean, there's a lot of brilliant people out there. Um, and I just think that the truth is, too, is like, you know, it just depends on how aware do you want to be. If you're an individual out there um, and you are waking up, there's so much information. There's the leak project. There's the decoders of truth. There's all these amazing researchers. I'm not even going to name them. There's so many of them. And you can get all this information and, and make a decision, you know, inter through internal discernment yourself. You don't have to be watching the news, you know. The, the mainstream news channels and CNN, MSNBC, all this nonsense, Fox News, CNN, you don't need to filter. You can filter all that out of your life, yeah. you know? So it, it, it does come down to an individual's choice as to what they're going to consume from an informational standpoint. And truly, you guys have said it great, you know, throughout this whole entire podcast, all the information is available to you. How, how willing are you as an individual to discern it? That's right. Well said. I like that. We have to have, we have to be able to develop this self-control aspect, right? Are we, are we advanced? Are we beings that have high intelligence? Are we children who can't control our own self-control demiurge is like, I'm hungry or I'm sleepy or I'm, oh, I want to just do something um, easy and not, not challenge. Go, go beyond the comfort zone of your, of your lives. Push yourselves. Go find the truth no matter where it leads. And yeah, I guarantee it'll, it'll improve your life because sitting in the background and remaining ignorant only lasts so long. Eventually, you're going to be in the dark too long, and it's going to it's going to be a very confusing place. Give a quick shout out to Decoders of Truth, Jay, because I know that just last month, didn't you have your fastest growing month with Decoders of Truth ever? Yeah, it's incredible, dude. We're actually almost at fifteen thousand. I mean, wait a minute, let me check. We might actually be over. I'm sorry, we're over fifteen thousand. In fact, <laughs> it's so out of control. I think it's like at fifteen thousand six hundred people. Hold on, I can tell you in two seconds. Um, you know, right that's, now, we, that's we have, great. We have 131 people that want to join the group, and we're at 15,586. And I'm not kidding you. We've probably gone up 5,000 members in the last six weeks. It's incredible. What so do you people think? People are becoming aware for sure. In, people in, in, want the truth, right? It's incredible. I mean, it's absolutely incredible. I mean, there's so many people that are waking up and, and, and trying to discern for themselves, like, what is and what's not truth. So yeah, it's great. I mean, and, and I mean that's very positive information. I appreciate you bringing that to my attention, Rex. Well, also, I mean, why do you think that is? What do you think was what caused the big jump? 
Well, I mean, I have my own theories. I mean, you and I have talked about it before. I believe there's great cosmic energy going on right now in the universe. I think that through solar radiation, um, the solar radiation changes, which you've measured, you know, numerous times. Um, I don't know, you know, obviously we put, we posited that theory last week that maybe CERN has moved us. Um, but the, I, I just think that overall, it's just, it's the age of Aquarius. You know, we're, we're, there's massive cosmic radiation, cosmic energy waves that people are starting to feel, and it definitely changes people's DNA. I actually just read an amazing article today. I wish I could find it right now um, about how DNA, you know, they used to think that DNA was completely static and you were born with your DNA, but now they realize that DNA is absolutely amenable and it changes based on, you know, your frequency, your love language, you know, your emotional commitment, you know, your service to others. I mean, it's truly amazing how much they're finding out. You know, obviously David, um, you know, our, He's written, uh, what's his name? Um, what's the guy, David? He's written the source field tech. His source field book talks a lot about the DNA. What's the guy's name, David? What's his last name? Um, I'm having David. a harp moment. I don't know. Yeah, no, no, it's okay. It's um, it's David Wilcox. David Wilcox. I couldn't think of him, but he wrote, you know, in the source field investigations, he talked about DNA as amenable, and that was like six years ago. And most people are like, whatever, bro. But now all the latest science is coming out and saying that it's true. Um, so it's fascinating, but that's my theory. What is your theory, Matt? Um, I agree. Um, I would just be careful. I, I think a lot of, um, uh, there's, there's research, there's truth to be found in, in a lot of places and there's also disinformation. So just when you're going down this, this path of, of trying to find out, um, how, how to uncover reality, just always have a filter of, of, of being objective, no matter where it comes from. And, and you'll always be steered correctly, no matter what. Yeah, no, no, actually, I, I, I did want to say, um, I believe that, um, I do believe that David Wilcox has been gotten to. I believe that a lot of his information that he's put out has been great. I do feel, I feel the Source Field Investigations is an amazing book, and everyone, you know, listening to this podcast should read that book. But as I told both of you guys, you know, when you start getting supported by the mainstream news, the New York Times, you know, all the quote unquote fake news, you know, the big, the big regimes that are controlled by the controllers, you got you to gotta really discern because at the end of the day, those are the guys that are calling the shots, you know, as far as infiltrating um, the, the message and infiltrating kind of the, the matrix as we would like to think. It. And like, so, like Michael Tellinger g giving in and saying flat earth is real. Well, I mean, all of it, 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 it you've got to discern. I mean, Michael, you know, who am I to say that Michael Tellinger has not put out amazing research? Because he has, right? I mean, slaves. Well, that's the whole point, isn't it? Right. He, he became too big. Right, right, right. But exactly. You know, and, and I have other people that are friends of mine or A-listers who have told me the same thing that, you know, that eventually when you get big enough, they come to you and they say, okay, you're going to make millions of dollars, but there's a cutoff because once you start making millions of dollars and you have a, you know, you're an influencer at a certain level of people, you can only say what is supportable by the mainstream. And I'm not going to mention names, Joe Rogan, but there's, there's a lot of people out there that know what's really going on who have shut the F up because they cannot afford financially or for their career to say what they have found to be true. And that well, is, I think more than that though, I think they get directly threatened. I think well, no, no, there's no question. No, no, no. Believe me, there's no question. Up, actually. There's no question. I have a very good friend. I will mention him. He's an A-lister and he's told me exactly what was told to him. And it's absolutely true. You're 100% accurate. You get to a certain level of it. You can only say certain things. Well, I'll, I'll never, I promise, the promise I have is I'll never, ever do that. So if I get big enough to be threatened like that, I'd rather just take the, the truth, the honest road, no matter what. So I and would never Rex, Rex people already, give me a hard time for living in my garage, but man, Rex I tell you, already that big, dude. I don't got to worry about it. I say, man, I live in my garage. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just somebody that's living in my garage. I'm like, Grandma, can I have a, a cheese sandwich and some tomato soup and some top ramen for dinner? You know, as long as I live with Grandma in the garage. I'm okay. They don't got it. They don't got to work. <laughs> Absolutely. I think Rex, you're 900,000 or 880,000 um, subscribers away from getting told off. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm still, I'm still just little potatoes, man. I am absolutely not even on the blip. And you know, that's good. I like it that way. I like to be unique anyway. I don't want to be on anybody's radar, but maybe that's the whole point guys. If, if we weren't, you know, a little bit less mainstream, we, we wouldn't be able to do this. Right. No, it's true. With, without a doubt, they would have already harped this. We've been shut down <laughs> for that. 
No, I, Bingo. Bingo. By the way, Matt, I'm the same way. I tell people this all the time. It doesn't matter how big I get, no matter how big my mission grows, they, I will never be bought off. I will always, you know, talk about things that I talk about, this kind of stuff. I live for this stuff. You know, um, I have a thriving career in the, you know, in the mainstream, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your perspective. And it's only getting bigger, but I will not be bought off. It doesn't matter. I mean, you, you know, people can write those words down for me. I will never be bought off. They'd kill me before I would be willing to, like, you know, be subverted. You can take our land, but you can't take our freedom! Yeah! Exactly. My, kids, right. my kids have never been vaccinated, and they never will be vaccinated. Good job, Jay. Hello, the man, the, we the legend, the way of life. Now, you know, let's, let's take a, a, a sidetrack here to the Book of the Dead. This is, I went through some more of these ancient hieroglyphics that are well over 3,000 years old, probably around the four or 5,000 year range. And you know what? They could be much older than that because these things were discovered next to tombs and also in the Great Pyramid of Cheops. And, you know, they say, oh, that Great Pyramid's only a few thousand years old. It's most likely a lot older than 12,000 years old. But, but anyway, let's just say it's only 4,000 years old. What I find, or actually it would be um, older than that because you're, about 5,200 years old, but okay. So here we go. The lion God, let me read this to you guys. And then I'm also going to, well, first, before I read it to you, check out the actual hieroglyphics. This tripped me out. These are the actual hieroglyphics that were translated that I'm about to read to you guys in the book of the dead. And the person that put this together, uh, his name is LePage Renu and very intelligent. He made this his life's work. He's no longer here in physical form, but I'll leave the links in the video description box on how you can actually read through these yourself. I mean, these take it to the next level. I mean, the Sumerians were very artistic. They were really into like cosmic plays and soap operas and the stars. The Egyptian stuff is, is like the next level. I mean, this stuff is just so beyond advanced, even in today's current technologies and then combined with the spiritual aspect of what these people were able to do and harness it, it's just phenomenal so look at this lion being here that's got this like can you guys see it yeah it looks like he's got a knife yeah he's got a, a knife and and he's definitely like it looks like he just jumped out of the pool and you know poor guy i can see why he's upset because clearly you know anyway just joking but you can see right here that <laughs> This guy down here that's like, man, what did I do? You're going to stab me with that knife? What's going on? This big lion man here. And you can read through some of the notes. But then when you go here and actually read about, let's go to the actual chapter itself in the Book of the Dead here, chapter 28, Lion God. I am Unbu, and what I abominate is the block of execution. Let not this whole heart of mine be torn from me by the divine champions in Heliopolis, O thou who closest, or O how let it do, O thou who clothest Osiris and hast seen Sutu, O thou who turnest back after having smitten him and hast accomplished the overthrow. The whole heart of mine remaineth weeping over itself in presence of Osiris, and strength proceedeth from him, it hath obtained it by prayer from him. I have had granted to it and awarded to it the glow of heart at the hour of the God of the broad face and have offered the sacrificial cakes in Hermopolis. Now, what are sacrificial cakes? Are those the ones that we hear about now, the modern occult stuff where they add some type of bodily fluids to these unleavened pieces of bread? I think it could be. Let yeah. not this whole heart of mine be torn from me it is I who entrust to you its place and stir your whole heart toward it in Sechet Hotepet and the years of triumph over all that it abhors and taking all provisions at thine appointed time from thine hand after thee. And this whole heart of mine is laid upon the tablets of Tamu who guideth me to the caverns of Sutu and who giveth me back my whole heart which hath accomplished its desire in presence of the divine circle which is in the netherworld. The sacrificial joint and the funeral raiment, let those who find them bury them. What do you guys think about that in reference to these right here that we're looking at, the petroglyphs? It's crazy. I think we're talking about Egyptian um, beings, most likely, you know, some higher up, higher up that were able to actually have this knowledge because most of the regular people didn't have it. We're talking about someone who was able to transcend 
I think, the, the third dimension and be able to actually pass on to, you know, if you look at who Osiris is, you can see the very strong connections to he's, you know, this being a reference to Enki and being some kind of a, um, that, uh, the great God who determines, you know, the hearts and, and, and how pure someone's soul is, you know, weighing them. So, it, and, and the lion God, I know the Sphinx was actually supposed to be a lion. So you, when you, when the, then it, it then um, was defaced and turned into what it is now. But so there's a lot of very interesting references to that. And we you know ancient Egypt, Egypt was the most advanced place in the ancient world after Atlantis disappeared. All the, the, um, the advanced knowledge and the, like the crystal Mies and all those went, they went to Egypt. So that's why you have all of this incredibly deep knowledge of knowing how to transcend the physical world and being able to go right into a higher conscious state that, right. that you could probably travel into the underworld, you know? Well, if you're eating the manna from God, as they called it, you know, the white, um, you know, the, the, what do you call it? The uh, monoatomic gold. gold. The monoatomic gold, right. So if you're eating that, it does talk about that, uh, Rex. Um, if you're if they're eating that then yeah then they can transcend or excuse me ascend you know obviously body out or leave their body um you know so to speak um it's, it it makes sense i mean i mean and, and again we're trying to make a literal interpretation of this um but you know my guess is that they weren't complete savages and they were cutting hearts out yeah you know and it's obviously more metaphoric um, but that's my guess is that, you know, they're talking about the, the and you mentioned it, Matt, the, 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 the mystery sex, the priests, you know, who truly, you know, were the, um, the, the uh, what do you call it? The, um, the keepers, the protectors. That's right. The keepers, the protectors of this information. And there you go. There's a picture of a priest right there. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're obviously able as, as mystery sect initiates, they're able to, um, to do this. You know, they have access to this, you know, monoatomic gold, the Ormies, and they're eating it or ingesting it or whatever they were doing, smoking it. And, you know, then they travel into the next dimension or travel to wherever it is, the netherworld or, um, you know, a different dimension or whatever. And so it makes a lot more sense when you think of it that way versus the literal interpretation, which is kind of crazy. I think that's what most times we have to look at is that not everything is always supposed to be literal. Sometimes it is, or maybe even pieces are literal and other things are metaphorical. I mean, taking the heart out of someone could mean you simply right. weigh their heart like uh, on a scale to see how pure it is. Does it have a lot of fear and hatred in it? Or is it, is it empty of those and it's full of compassion? So well, they were, uh, Osiris was always weighing, weighing the souls and the hearts of, of the men here. Well, the scary part though, too, is if I can like kind of infer, you know, and go into like when you, you guys were doing, you guys did your little round about, um, you know, the, uh, me the uh, what do you call it? The, uh, not Mesopotamian, but the, uh, the Mesoamerican, you know, and all the sacrifice, right? The blood yep. sacrifice and Inkul Khan and all that stuff went back down. I mean, they were cutting the hearts out. What if they just didn't understand, you know, what their Anunnaki masters were really teaching them and it became blood. And I know that there was probably some sort of a subversion from the, um, the, the dark brotherhood um, at some point that possessed them. But I mean, what if it was too, that they just didn't understand and they were cutting hearts out trying to get, you know, the Anunnaki, you know, interdimensional beings or, or um, you know, dimensional travelers to come back. And that's why they killed and, and sacrificed so many. Yeah. I don't know. That, that, that's a good point. It's like taking it too literal and you're so desperate at that point because right. the gods have been gone so long. Gods have left you, yes. That you take it, you take it literal. And, and um, like when I was in, when I, mean, I was in Chichen Itza um, and I'm, you know, I was looking at the struggle between Kukukan and, and, the, and the eagle that shows this, this battling back and forth where it has the pine cone seed of knowledge in its mouth kind of holding humanity with what knowledge it wants to give. I find it fascinating that we had these cultures that were built up with knowledge in the stars, and then we have them all becoming sac uh, corrupted with blood sacrifice and war. And I just see that as this continual competition with these sons. Um, we gotta, we gotta fig to, to figure out who they are, like Kuku Khan, like Jay just mentioned, that's simply Ning Shida Thoth, right. versus this other son of Enlil, right? This competition of Ninurta. And I see these sons of both of these factions always just competing. You know, Thoth will, will build up a civilization and teach them everything and then move on and then they'll, they'll, the eagle will come in and corrupt them and make them believe that blood sacrifice will actually right. uh, help them. It's crazy. You guys, when you look at these images right here and um, especially the one on the right, it looks like they're taking a big bong rip on the left. You know, they've got the, the dual hookah there. Yeah, I see that. They're getting baked. But on the right, it looks like 
they're getting mummified and they're yeah, doing- exactly i was just gonna say that they're bound and gagged right now and and yeah and to add to that i'm thinking to myself you know and one thing that i do think gerald clark has done a very good job in is analyzing the human antenna aspect so when i think about that and i've studied these different positions you know the prana and other uh, positions that you will do for meditation and certain yeah. breathing techniques that will take you into specific essence. And if they're getting ready for the, the, the other side, the, the nether world, the underworld, this physical embodiment, the way that they are located, and then in conjunction, it looks like there's some type of tool that's being used, something, and, and, you know, pottery as well. I don't know what kind of medicine or herbs or tinctures or smoke or whatever they're using. And can, well, I mean, it looks like they got baked first on the left there. They're like, okay, first we're going to get baked and then we're going to give you some, uh, some hallucinogens and then we're going to sit you down and you'll be fine even though you're entombed in this. And position thing. them to a specific position, right? Right. So, but they get in this specific position and then they're connected with, you know, the universe in a certain way as an antenna. And that would make sense to me. So they're, they're like blasting off. They're like, yeah, they're really, that's it. They're not really dying. They're, they're creating passing. their own essence and going through that, that portal in, in, in this sense. I mean, that's what I'm saying. They took it yeah. to a science. That's right. They're actually excited to with, with those, what they're doing right there. They're not, you know, screaming and crying and no, they're excited to go and pass into this, this next stage of their life. This next, this next place where their, their consciousness can travel. If it's done a certain way, they can probably, track where those consciousness would go of those certain kings mind boy and, and let's do this real quick let's actually now that we've seen it let's see how close we are in the tr in the translation here so 27 that would be this one right here so we've got oh ye gods who seize upon hearts and who pluck out the whole heart and whose hand fashion anew the heart of a person according to what he hath done lo now let hath let that he forgiven to him be you. Hell to you, O ye lords of everlasting time and eternity. Wow. Wow. Let not my heart be torn from me by your fingers. Let not my heart be fashioned anew according to all the evil things said against me. For this heart of mine is the heart of the God of mighty names, of the great God whose words are in the members, and who giveth free course to his heart, which is within him. Yeah. And most of his inside, heart. That's really good is the heart among the gods ho to me heart of mine i am in possession of thee i am the master and thou art by me fall not away from me i am the dictator to whom thou shalt obey in the netherworld so if we go back to these images and look at these again you're going to see that toth is the almighty god that's right so they're hitting on toth again he's he's in egyptian stuff sumerian stuff he's right. in all sorts of cultures and walks of 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 right of passage and he's one of those underlying icons that pop up all over the place. He mastered he mastered the physical and the and the underworld. So he yep. that's what he was probably teaching. Te basically teaching them. What do you think about Toth, Jay? I mean, he's an amazing dude. I mean, I, you know, <laughs> I, I could go on and on and speak with him, and I, I literally have to leave here in a couple of minutes. I'm getting pulled yeah, pulled, I do too. Uh, pulled away by the fam. Um, but <laughs> I, I mean, my my viewpoint of Toth is amazing. I mean, I as I've told you guys many times, I believe that he comes to us. I think he has done, you know, quote unquote, walk-ins to famous uh, figures all throughout history. I think, I think politicians, I think, um, you know, generals, war generals, Freemasons uh, and stuff. I, I, I think that he has come and, 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 and kind of intervened in our, you know, societies in our, in our histories at various points, very, you know, opportune times. Um, you know, Gerald's alluded to that in his book with the professor you know, Manly Hall talks about that in the secret yeah. teachings of all ages. Um, I believe that he is just an amazing, you know, character. Um, where, where it really gets weird for me with him, though, is because I've always thought that he was mostly positive um, and, 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 um, and beneficial, clearly. Um, there may be times where he's like a lot of these Anunnaki, where he kind of just switches sides. And he doesn't represent evil, per se, but he kind of represents like chaotic neutral. And he, you know, you could interpret, you know, what he does or his gestures or his, you know, intervention in a different way. You could, you could interpret it positive or negative, depending on what side of the, I guess, coin or, or what side of the clans you're on. So it's, it's fascinating. I, but, but thought is definitely an amazing, amazing, uh, you know, figure throughout history. You read about Thoth and his name was actually Ning Shida before that. And he talks about in the Emerald Tablets, how he gave up 
his right to, to the gods in heaven and Nibiru to stay here and be a teacher to mankind. And everything I've looked at, like Jay said, all the different influences he's dad had all throughout our timeline, I really don't think we would be here still if it wasn't for him. No. I think we would have annihilated ourselves. We would have been gone. We would have been gone. So many times he's come through. And again, I, I, I believe this. I believe that Hollywood, you know, certain, you know, factions of the Anunnaki are weaving thought into Hollywood too. And I think he's actually been probably represented by certain characters. I mean, he might be Yoda. You know, I mean, I mean, just to bring one person right out from, you know, from behind, but like, you know, somebody who is, you know, a, a, a philosopher, a wise one, um, you know, pro-human, pro-evolution pro, um, of our species would be a representative of thought. He's usually the one that's there to help us. And that's what he actually claims in the Emerald Tablets that he, right. that's what he, he's dedicated himself to Anu to do. Anu actually, he actually told Anu he wants to be the teacher to mankind. And that's, that's not just his, uh, his decision. That's the decision that's been made. He is the teacher of mankind. He traveled to the Duat. Yeah. Right on. Well, you guys, I much appreciated you being here. Thank you very much for staying a little bit longer with us. I know that we've got a happy audience and they are thankful as well. I'd recommend checking out the Decoders of Truth Facebook page. Also check out trtrevolution.com and look up Matthew LaCroix on YouTube, The Illusion of Us, Matthew LaCroix on Amazon. Make sure to pick up your copy today. And also, I want to give a quick shout out to Tiger Stream. I picked up one of these streaming media boxes a few months ago and i've had an opportunity to really get to um know the the features and benefits of this thing versus a you know because i've also got the, the the different i've got what is it called not a kindle stick but a roku stick and i've got the roku box i've got like a gen 3 apple tv um, on my Roku, I've got um, Netflix, I've got Amazon, I've got Hulu. Hulu, I've got cable because my cable and internet's cheaper than just internet, so I have all that with it. And you know what? I rarely even watch Hulu or um, Netflix or any of those anymore because with my Tiger Stream, it's just it's so much cooler. And and not only can I stream movies and TV shows and sporting events and live TV. I can also play the Android games that I can play on my phone. So with my big screen TV and my surround sound speakers, instead of just having that, you know, Samsung phone and that screen that's on the phone, I've actually now got a 55 inch plasma or 50 inch actually. And it's just awesome. So I would definitely look into these Tiger Streams. I worked out a promotion with them. They worked out a promotion with me where if you click on the link, check out the Tiger Stream, you will get $100 off for that special. And these things do cost more than a Roku or than one of those Tiger or one of those, not Tiger Stick, but one of those like streaming sticks. It's definitely worth it. It's, it's a night and day difference. Now, if you don't have a whole lot of money, then one of those sticks might be a good option for you. But if you can spend a few bucks I would definitely recommend one of these things because not only are they awesome and they offer a whole lot more features, but you've actually got customer service that is there to help you. And they will, like they'll actually talk to you, a real person. So check it out, Tiger Stream. Click the link on the video description box. That is my shameless plug, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, oh, Jay. Thanks, Matthew. You guys are awesome. I appreciate you being here with me. Guys, Thanks, awesome guys. it was really awesome to be here. Let's keep it going. We'll talk again next week. Absolutely. Right on. And thank you, everybody else, for being here with us. Be excellent to each other, ladies and gentlemen, and be the change you want to see.